sort of fake uh, religious stuff in the world. I mean, it doesn't bother me near as much as it used to when all those televangelists were all over the TV. It seems like we have you know, the internet now, so we've got even more things to disbelieve, you know. Um, I, I actually happen, to, I'm, I am quite spiritual about all of it. Um, it's not really, you know, this guy's religion or that guy's religion, although you know, on earth, you know, mankind seems to do that. Um, I, all of that, I mean, put it this way, they're all good and they all have flaws too. And if people, for the people who believe this way or that way, I think that's all great, you know, I think we're all gonna, well, most of us, except the Saltans, uh, <laughs> all going to go to that wonderful place that you could call heaven or what, all the other names for it. Um, he's already wherever he's going. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I happen to believe that it kind of what you said about other dimensions, I, I mean, to me, it even goes further. I, I, it's convenient to think of God as you know, the one that Michelangelo or Leonardo uh, drew or painted. Uh, that guy with, you know, imposing guy with a white beard and he's way up there. But I really think that it's, that we are all part of a, the huge body that is the universe or whatever infinity is. Uh, kind of like cells in your body, right? Um, it's one huge mass, all of it, everything. And we are all, in that, we're all part of it, and of course, um, what's good for the whole is is how you should be. There, you know, I mean, we understand the concept of cancer, that be something in your body that's negative, you know, and I, I believe that's the same kind of metaphor for what I think is reality, that if there's something very negative that's bothering the whole, and I think there's a mass consciousness too. You know, and I, I don't mean just living things like us. I think all of it. Um, you know, a rock out there in the in the field, or you know, it's just all part of it. Um, there's, I think, there's even a consciousness to all of it that we're not self-aware, but still we're all part of it. And it's up to us. I, you know, I think to use the term God, I think He wants us to be happy and be uh, happy in the place that we are with, within, and to be positive, certainly. And I think love, actually, that feeling of love, that sense of love, is sort of another expression, another way of saying that you're connected and it's all good. And let me point out that I recently, about five minutes before I got up here, touched the good book, my good book, which Julie brought. This, oh. is, uh, this is John's songbook. Uh, this is this is better than the Talmud or uh, <laughs> Old Testament, New Testament. Uh, don't tell don't tell my rabbi I said that. Uh, but John, can you explain what this is? And this is an amazing thing to touch and hold. I, I unlike John, I immediately took a picture of myself with it. Uh, uh, because can you read what the first two words are in this well, book? Well, first, first let me explain yeah. the, uh, the meaning for this. I've been writing songs, certainly from the time I was about eight years old. Not that they were any good, but uh, around eight, I remember uh, thinking about Green River. It was one of them. Um, and I think it had actually had started before, but I don't, re I don't remember the words to those songs, nor um, what my method might have been. But I had always kind of, you know, like most artists and certainly uh, mus musical people, I always just kind of waited for inspiration. And then when it happened, I, oh, I'd be fumbling around the house to find a napkin or a piece of paper and then a crayon or something to write down. Anyway, um, I went on active duty with the Army Reserve in early 67, it was January. And I got out in uh, the middle of July, um, and I decided you know, within a month or so, you know, I got to get more organized. If I'm really going to do this for a living, you know, and be professional, whatever that is, I need to get organized. So I went down to the local store and bought this binder um, and a 
little, you know, sheave of blank paper. I came home, you know, on the very first page, I actually very optimistically wrote song titles. Uh, that was the uh, title page, and the rest were all empty, of course. The idea that this was a, you know, empty book uh, of, with blank pages just waiting for my creations or my inspirations. Um, a little time passed, maybe two or three days, something like that, and the phrase or the words Proud Mary came into my head. I didn't have a clue what it meant. I didn't know what's that about. I mean, I really didn't know. I'm trying to be as gentle as I can with this uh, almost 50 year old book. But anyway, here the very first entry, the first line is Proud Mary. Um, Not a bad place to start with maybe the greatest song of our time. <clears throat> to uh, be in line with the question you had asked before, there are many times that I, I believe I was guided about Proud Mary. Uh, a few, can I tell it like as quick as I can, rat me Please. and speed up and hear a little bit? Um, so I didn't know what Proud Mary meant, and uh, as you saw, I began to write other things in the book, you know. Uh, a few months went by, it was literally the next June, around June of 1968, and I had been working on a, one project rather earnestly, and that was to try and get relieved from the rest of my military duty. I was in the Army Reserve, and it looked like I probably, with my obligation was another three years or so, but I was trying to have a rock and roll career, so the Army and my hairdo were having uh, uh, a big conflict, among other things. Um, and so I've been working on trying to get discharged from the Army. And if those of you who were around in those days, you know, some people went to Canada, some people pretended they were gay as if that would get them out of the military. You know, all kinds of things were open. And I believe I thought about all of those. Eventually, though, um, I wrote to my congressman, Jerome Waldy, in uh, Contra Costa County, and uh, he started kicking the tires around the, the military, and they don't like that. And eventually, it, I met a, a civilian at the Presidio in San Francisco named Mr. Legere, who has a rev revered, revered place in my heart, anyway. And he really helped me. Well, anyway, one day in June, there was my army discharge sitting on the steps of my apartment house. And I was, whoa, I mean, that was a big day, a very happy day. I turned a little uh, cartwheel right on the grass in front of the building. I went inside and grabbed my Rickenbacker guitar, which wasn't plugged in, but they still kind of have an acoustic resonance when you play. I started playing some chords that were a little bit like Beethoven's fifth. And the next thing you know, these words were coming to me. Left a good job in the city, working for the, you know, that was the military. I, I mean, it had just happened. I sat there and uh, started following the storyline of this thing. For the first time, I was connecting with the Mississippi River, uh, with paddle wheel boats, uh, kind of, you know, Mark Twain Americana without having a word for it. And this was way better than Betty Lou why did you make me so blue? You know, this was a real story. You know, wow, wow, what's this? What is this about? And I turned into my book, and there on the first line it said, Proud Mary. And it's the name of the boat. Proud Mary is the name of a boat. Wow. And, you know, and there I was. Um, I just feel like something had like, you know, kind of been pulling me to do this, and it took a few months. And when I was done and I had that piece of paper words on it, I was literally trembling because I knew in that moment that I had written a really good song, a great song. I had grown up knowing about people like Hoagy Carmichael and Oiving Berlin and Harold Arlen, you know, of course Lennon and McCartney and Lieber and Stoller and Doc Pumas and all these people. Um, and I felt that I, that this song was certainly the, by far way above anything I'd ever done. And I had finally entered into the land where the greats were. And it, you know, all of that seems to have been a pretty straight line. Absolutely, and I've stood with musicians 
very famous musicians who, when they've heard you play that song, always go, I can't believe anyone wrote that song. That song seems to have always existed. I certainly can't believe a guy who looks as good as John wrote that song, because <laughs> it seems literally like it could go back to, uh, if not, you know, Irving Berlin and Stephen Foster to like the Bible. It just has a utter timeless greatness. 